If you'd like to follow along, I'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I think I'm going to read the first five verses and stop there. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with, a, with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom ye have not preached, we have not preached, excuse me, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might bear with him. For I suppose that I was not a whit behind the very cheapest apostles. And I'm just going to stop right there. Because Paul goes on to tell him about what he's done while he was at Corinth. But here's the thing. Uh, my title, Paul, is single-minded. Single-minded. We preach. That's what I do when I come here. We preach. And we preach knowing that we cannot explain God to fallen men. But we preach. We preach. We endeavor to proclaim a risen Lord to fallen men. Now, in order to have a risen Lord, it necessitates the explanation of his dying. And his dying means that we have to proclaim his life on earth as a man. And his life tells us we have to tell of his incarnation, his condescension, his birth, as a child on this earth, the son that was given. We preach as best we can, God manifest in the flesh. And go on, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world. People don't understand that's just as big a miracle as in the rest of it. They think it's nothing that people believe the gospel. You're supposed to. No, 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 no. It's right here with this. God manifests in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, and received up into glory. In short, we preach Christ and him crucified. And we preach to believers and unbelievers alike. Because there's only one gospel, there's only one message. Believers believe and unbelievers do not. God is sufficient and we are not. And we preach. That's what we're here for. But here Paul is writing this letter to people he had preached to before who had believed. He's writing to the believers at Corinth. And he says, bear with me in my folly. And the word my is interpolated, so you could read it, bear with me a little in folly. And then he repeats it. Bear with me. Bear with me. Understand, this is important because Paul repeating himself shows that this is important. And he says these words, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Paul has a reason for what he refers to as his folly or as folly. 
But it's not a fleshly reason. It's a godly reason. I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Paul wasn't jealous over them as people. Paul was jealous over them as, has, as those whom he had preached the gospel to and that they believed. Paul is speaking as the man who came and stayed with the Corinthians for a year and a half. And the reason that he had stayed there for a year and a half was I preached it last week. God told him, I have much people in this city. So Paul knew God still had much people in this city. But he says he preached to him under the explicit orders from Jesus Christ, and he states it this way. And I love the way this is, is stated. He espoused them to one husband. Espoused them to one husband. What's that mean? Basically, the word means betrothed. The other way of, of definition for that word is bound. I've, you are bound to one husband. I've binded you to one husband. Why does that mean? I preached one gospel. I preached one Jesus Christ. I preached one risen Lord. I preached one Christ crucified. He wrote that in the first epistle to the Corinthians. Determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. He's espoused you to one husband. He preached to you the true and the living Jesus Christ by the gospel of Christ. And you believed. You believe. That's who he's writing to. And then he says these next uh, three words. But I fear. This is why there's a warning. This is why Paul says what my folly, I fear, I fear. You understand, God knows them that are his. God knows their condition and God is in control and Paul knows that. But here's the thing, but I fear. We do. We do. Paul is writing as an apostle to those to warn those to whom he had preached the gospel. Walter, a pastoral comment, a warning, a concern. And this is not the first one Paul wrote to the Corinthians about. Let's just put it that way. I'm not going to go into it. But he says there's one particular fear I got here. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Now I'm not going to keep you long today. But I do want to point this out. Paul is not worried about pool halls and beer joints. You understand? He's not worried about drunkenness here. This is not what he's talking about. He dealt with some other problems in the other epistle that needed to be dealt with. About eating and drinking at the Lord's table and other things. Other things they had problems with. Like I said, I'm not going to go into that. But the Corinthians had their problems. But that's not what he's talking about here. That's not. He's worried about them being beguiled through subtlety. Through subtlety. And in particular, Paul is worried about religious subtlety. And I am too. Uh... You understand, this world hasn't changed for the better, for the better, in 2,000 years, or around 2,000 years when this is written. But there's another part of that. Because man has changed, but for the worse. It says it in Scripture. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. And there's going to be people around who have itching ears, it says. And they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And what will they do? They lead away from the Christ of God. That's what it is. Paul's worried about subtlety. 
because subtle changes are easier to overlook. They really are. And here we are after 2,000 years of subtle changes. And what have we got? Well, I tell you to turn on the news and watch, but I don't want you to really do that if you don't want to. We are surrounded by violence in the name of religion. We are surrounded by hatred in the name of religion. We are surrounded by diversion, division, and madness. Now, it's not all in the name of religion. Some's in the name of race. Some's in the name of, of hatred. Some's just ignorance. I mean, just plain ignorance. But that's what we're surrounded by, people. 2,000 years, and things have not gotten better. But subtle changes come in. That's why he said the word beguiled, deceived. What did Christ say? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Yeah. What's that mean? It's a little thing. It's a little change. May not seem like much, but you end up with people getting saved by their own free will. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you this. Some years ago, in Paul's day, that same thing was going on. Yeah. You understand? There were Jews running around at that time. Judaizers is what they called them. They said they were believers. But then they would tell people they had to be circumcised. Had to be yeah. circumcised. To keep that part of the law, just that little bitty part, according to the law of Moses, you had to be circumcised to be saved. What was that? That was a little leaven. And Paul withstood Peter to the face just because Peter went from eating with the Gentiles over to eating with some Jews that came to visit. What was that? That was a little leaven. That was a little leaven. And you're saying Paul did not stand for it. Why? Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You start separating the people of God? Uh-uh. Christ said there's one fold and there's one shepherd. And I'm single-minded about that. There's one fold and there's one shepherd. And there's no division between the people of God. And I'll be bolder still. There never has been. Because there has only ever been one shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And that's Old Testament and New. And you can take that however you want to. I'll explain it someday. And you might believe me, you might not. I don't know. But it's in the scriptures. There's only one salvation, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. But subtle changes may be overlooked. A beguiling. A beguiling. What does Paul warn in another, another book? I think it's Paul. He warns about Satan's ministers. What about them? Well, they don't come as ministers of darkness. No, yeah. oh, he said they come as ministers of light. Yeah. Now, they don't come as ministers of the light, Jesus Christ, because they'll subtly change it just a little bit, you know. Christ is necessary, but he's made salvation available for you. Yeah. Have you ever heard that? Christ has made it possible for man to be saved. But you've got to believe. You've got to come. You, some of them say you've got to be baptized. Subtle changes. Oh, no, we believe in Jesus. We believe he's Lord. We believe he's the one that saved everybody. But you have to. All right. You start hearing preaching like that, somebody's changing something. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is our salvation. We are redeemed. We were redeemed over 2,000 years ago when he died and was resurrected. Redemption has passed and salvation is come. 
and his coming now to his people, but that's still through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. I'm sorry, I feel enough Baptist to say that every Sunday, Walter. Why? By grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. We are what? His workmanship. A lot of Baptists don't want to read that part. I don't understand it. We're his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Salvation is of the Lord. That's what it says in Jonah. Salvation is of the Lord. Because it is. But he's worried, he says here, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, that you, so your mind should be corrupted from what? The simplicity that is in Christ. Now, simplicity is a tricky word. A lot of people want to take it and say, here's God's simple plan of salvation. It's really not. It's really not. Man is simple. God is not. There is a simplicity in Christ, but I like another word better. And I've heard Henry use it, and I heard Earl use it, and I looked it up in the Greek, and it's there. That's what is actually the first definition of this Greek word is singleness that is in Christ. There's a singleness in Christ, and I really like that word. That's the first definition of the word. The singleness that is in Christ Christ is our Lord. Christ is our life. Christ is our light, and Christ is our truth. Now, this is also true. Christ is the Lord, whether he's your Lord or not. Christ is the life, whether he's your life or not. Christ is the light, whether he's your light or your blind. And Christ is the truth, period. Then as Paul has said several places, there is the singular gospel of Christ. What is it? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The singular gospel. It's the gospel of God. It's the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of God's dear son. It's the gospel of truth. And it's the gospel. There's only one. Anything else, let's just be blunt about it. Anything else is a lie. If you're saved by your own free will, that's a lie. If they tell you that, they're telling you a lie. Because that's not what this book says. This book says, and I quoted it last week, with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. The singular gospel of Christ, one new birth, one gospel, one walk, one fellowship, one flock, one church, one body, and one head. One head. There's one land as if had been slain from before the foundation of the world. And that lamb, that man, Christ Jesus, arose and ascended to the Father, and he is seated on the right hand of the Father, expecting his enemies to be made his footstool. There's only one Christ. There's only one Christ. And matter of fact, what can you say about Christ in heaven? You can say what, what he was on earth, but here's this. Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Yeah. What's that mean? That means that Christ is sovereign. You want to say any different, you're lying. You want to say he's mostly sovereign, partly sovereign, but he won't go against your free will, you're lying. I'm sorry, folks, that's just the truth of it. 
He's in the heaven. He's done whatsoever he hath pleased. And right now, he is doing whatsoever he pleases. And what's he going to do? Well, he's going to do whatsoever he pleases. You understand, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He always has done what he pleased. He is doing what he pleased. I don't like saying this. And he's going to do what he has pleased. Oh, there's a singleness in Christ. A singleness in Christ. It's not simple, but it is single. And it is simple. How do you do this? Because in all things, God has given it to him. In all things, Christ has the preeminence. The preeminence. Oh, I like that. And there's a reason. Because Jesus Christ is the preeminent one. And there is none beside him. There is none beside God. Because the singleness of Jesus Christ is real. And he is the one with whom we have to do. The singleness of Christ. There is no other. What did Paul say here in this chapter? I have espoused you to one husband. To one husband. You know why? Because there only is one husband. And what are we called in other places? Talking about the bride of Christ. It seems weird for me to talk about having a husband. It seems weird to me. It's scriptural though. But we are his body. He is the head. And we are espoused one husband. Paul says, don't be beguiled. Don't let any subtlety slip. You understand? We say it, and we say it again and again. This book, this scripture, is our sole proof, if you want to put it that way. Our sole authority for what it is. The truth of God saved for us, preserved for us, given to us. What man says has to be taken in context of this book. We don't take this book in the context of what men say. What's it say then? For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might, bear, ye might well bear with them. But here's the thing. If they speak not according to the law and the testimony, it's because there's no light in them. You understand? It's not because that there's a little light in them. It says there's no light in them. Paul's warning here is real. Very real. You understand? And, and Paul was giving this warning 2,000 years ago, Walter. 2,000 years ago. Man hadn't gotten any better. I already said it. Man's not getting any better. You know, if that's not proof of against evolution, I don't know what he is. You understand? Uh, and Paul here was actually relaying the words of Christ in part. Matthew 24 and verse 23. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Believe it not. For there shall arise. I mean, he's already said it. These are the words of Christ. There shall arise false Christ. And I'm going to tell you this. That's not just some idiot saying, I'm Jesus. Although it does include those. God wouldn't leave out the idiots. We're full of them. It's not just that. But there shall arise false Christ, what? And false prophets. And false prophets. And shall show great signs and wonders 
insomuch that, and I love this part, if it were possible, they shall delete, deceive the very elect. Thank God it's not possible. But it's not because you're so smart. It's because God's so powerful. It's because God's so good. And here's the thing. And this is, this is the, 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 when you, you start thinking about these things, sometimes it, it will blow your mind a little bit. It will just kind of stun you, okay? You understand? False prophets and false Christs are for my good and God's glory. All things work together for good to them that love God. What, does that include false prophets? You bet it does. You bet it does. He's got to arm you against them. He's got to arm you against being beguiled. Like the serpent did with Eve. With his subtlety. you got to learn the nuances. People will try to sneak stuff in. That's what Paul said in, in, when he's talking to the Ephesians. He says, they're going to come from among you. What? Grievous wolves in sheep's clothing. In sheep's clothing. They will try to beguile you. They'll try to deceive you. They'll try to misdirect you. To while you're looking over here, they're slipping in something up front. And what? A little leaven still leavens the whole lump. John wrote of the spirit of Antichrist was now already in the world. Again, around 2,000 years ago. Deceivers who confess not that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh, come in the flesh. Here's the thing. Anything against the true Christ is antichrist. Anything against the true Christ. And it's already here. It's been here for over 2,000 years. It's been here since the world was made. You understand what it is? <laughs> Your fathers slew the prophets. The, now he's talking about the prophets of God. And he was talking to Jews. There were those who were burned by the church of Rome for holding forth this Christ. Now, I'm not calling for those days to come back. But you understand, man is exactly the same, and if he could get away with it. I've seen the hatred in their eyes. Walter, you were there. Linda, Pam, you were there. I don't know if you were there, Paul, or not at that time. But, man, I mean, seriously. I didn't hear it. Walter said it, told me later, said, let's hang them up from a tree. Why? Because of speaking about this Christ, the singleness of Christ, leaving out any and all of man's works, that's the singleness of Christ. Now, I was talking to Deb in the kitchen yesterday, and I told her, I said, there is in reality a reality to that phrase, the simplicity that's in Christ. Because there's a lot of questions you can ask a believer that have one single answer. Who do you preach? Christ. Who do you believe? Christ. Who do you love? Christ. Why do you drive past 50 churches to get to this place? Christ. And because Christ is preached here. And where are you going? Well, we're going to Christ. He's coming for his church and his people. Believers are identified with Christ because believers are in Christ Jesus. Now the world, the world sees us as narrow-minded, 
I like single-minded better. The world, Walter, may say that we're bigoted. That we won't give any heed to their thoughts, to their beliefs, or their reasons, or their denomination. We're not broad-minded enough. That's what I've heard. You're too narrow-minded. We're too narrow-minded to see their point of view. And my answer to all those things is, yes, I am, by his grace. But here's the reason why. And I've tried to explain this, but they don't get it, but I think you might. You understand? I used to have their point of view. I used to know their point of view because it was mine. Now, it may not have been exactly the same one as the person who's talking to me, but I had all my own thoughts about God. And you know what? I had to be shown I was wrong. Believers are the only ones who know what it is like to be an unbeliever and to be a believer. Yeah. Yeah. Believers are the only one who know they're no longer in the pit. Remember the pit from which you are dig. And I like what Walter said one time. Don't go there and dance around the edge of it. Just remember it. Why? Because the rest of the world around you is still in that pit. And that's their point of view. And I refuse to go back to that point of view. But I know about it. I know about it. Oh, no. We don't have blind faith. We have faith that sees. We've been given eyes that see, ears that hear, and a heart that understands. Otherwise, I'd be right there with them fussing at you guys. And I know that. Uh, believers are the only ones who know both sides of this discussion. But believers are now single-minded in Christ Jesus. We can get distracted. We can get blindsided sometimes. But in here, there is a single-mindedness, a gift of God from Jesus Christ and his spirit and the Father above to know his Son. And the singleness that is in Christ Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for this day and this time. Thank you, Lord. For your Son, our Lord, who came and gave himself for us. And is now calling us out of this world into his marvelous light opening blind eyes, opening deaf ears, giving a heart of flesh that can understand your word and your will in your book. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Be with Walter and Paul as they come to preach your gospel. We will give you all the honor and glory because it's yours now and forever. Amen.